Since we are in what is usually the busiest shopping season and whatnot of the year, I thought it would be a, a good idea to present, uh, present this lesson in these terms, putting it in this angle of what we're going to be looking at and talking about regarding the phrase, the customer is always right. But what we're really going to be approaching as we go through this lesson, we're going to be examining that, that thought and that phrase and the truth behind it or rather the lack thereof. But really what we're talking about is the idea that we as Christians are salesmen of a sort. And that what we are doing is going out into the world as we see in the Great Commission and so many other places in scriptures where we are to go and to teach the gospel to the whole world, to everyone that we come in contact with. We have more or less a sales pitch of why we are trying to convince them that they need Christ in their life. Why they need the salvation that he offers. We're trying to get them to understand the position that they're in of being lost in sin, the danger of that, the eternal danger that they're facing, and to realize the need and the necessity for God and for the forgiveness that comes through Christ. That's more or less what we talk about. And it might seem odd or even crass to you to put it in terms of uh, sales pitch, but basically that's what we're doing. We're talking to people, trying to convince them, trying to show them what they need. The only difference between us and so many salesmen in the world is they're trying to convince people that they need something that really they don't. But we're trying to convince people that they need something that they truly, desperately need, more than anything else. And so let's keep that thought in mind as we go throughout the lesson. We want to start in Matthew chapter 11 as we see here the basic rundown of what Christ is offering and how he phrased this as he spoke to individuals about himself and about what it was that he had that they needed. He says there near the end of the chapter in verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And what he's saying there, you know, come to me, all you who, who are heavy laden, those who labor, and I will give you rest. He's, he's offering rest. It sounds good. And that's the message that we hear most of the time in the, in the religious world world around us, that God is nothing but love and mercy and forgiveness and it's all good things all the time. But you notice there are a couple things that Jesus mentions here on top of that as well. And it doesn't take away from the fact that he is offering rest, that he is there to help them, to save them, but he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. A yoke is the thing you put on oxen when they're getting ready to work. So he's saying, I'm going to put a yoke on you. You're going to work for me. There is some effort that's going to be involved. And he says, learn of me. Learn from me. Now, some people are, it seems, natural born students. They just soak up information like a sponge. Other people, if you ask them to, to learn something, to figure something out, it's fighting tooth and nail the whole time, the entire way. And... Again, this is something that sometimes people chafe against. I have to learn. There's effort involved. There's thinking involved. If you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to follow Christ, then yes. Now, obviously, it's worth that in the end. He's offering rest. He says, you will find rest for your souls, but you're going to have to learn about him. You're going to have to learn from him, learn from his, ex from his example, and you're going to have to take his yoke upon you. Now, he says that his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and it is. To be a Christian, to do the things that God is asking us to do, as the scriptures say, his commandments are not burdensome. They're not that difficult. They're not that complicated. We make it difficult for ourselves. And it's not to say that the life of being a Christian would be an easy one, because we might face persecution, we might face ridicule from others. But to do the actual work, to simply follow his commandments, it's just not that hard. For those of us who are in Christ, we know it's really not. We still find ways to mess it up. We still find lame excuses as to why we have better things to do, but it's just not that difficult to be a Christian, to follow Him, to just read the Bible, to understand it, and to do it. 
because we believe it, because we know it to be the truth, and because we have faith in Christ. And again, this is the idea that we have to get across to people, that they need to be a Christian, what it means to be a Christian, why they ought to be a Christian, and this is what they have to do. And it's our job to boil that down, put it in the simplest language that they can understand, and to show them why this is necessary, to show them why they need it, to show them why it's a good thing, that there will be rest for their soul. So many people have this twisted around the other way. They see religion, they, they see faith as being restrictive. There's so many rules and regulations, and that means I can't do what I want to do, when really, if you read the Bible, if you know God's Word, you see what it says. It is the new law, the law of liberty. It does set us free from sin. There is rest to be found there. It's not nearly as hard or as complicated as so many people want to make it out to be. But keeping all that in mind, how we ought to go out into the world and talk to people, trying to get to them the basic point of what Jesus is making here. This is what he has to offer. Does that sound good to you? And of course, the choice is always left up to them, as the choice is left up to us, whether we're going to follow him or whether we're going to do what we want to do. But examining this phrase that the customer is always right, I'm not going to talk down to you. I'm going to assume you're just as wise to the ways of the world as anybody else. We know why companies, we know why businesses say this. They want to snag customers. So they promise that there's good service. Well, the customer is always right. You come here and you're going to be right no matter what. We're going to cater to your every, not only your every need, but your every whim. They do this thinking that it'll get them more customers, it'll get them more business, they'll make more money in the long run. So they say, without question, that the customer is always right. But we know it's not true. Even if you've never worked on the business side of this, even if you've only approached this being a customer, you know you're not always right. Sometimes we might think we are, we'd like to be, but we know none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. We've talked about this time and time again. Now it might be an honest mistake, honest mistake that we just don't have all the facts or we misunderstood something. Now sometimes it's not an honest mistake. Sometimes we are trying to get the better of someone. Sometimes we're trying to take advantage of them when we should not. But for whatever reason, we know we're simply not right all the time. No one is. No one ever could be. So this idea that the customer is always right, it just can't be true. And especially if you've worked at this from the business side of this, then you know how bad this can be. When your company has a clearly spelled out policy that this is how it is and someone comes in demanding that it's wrong, demanding that it be fixed, and you try to tell them simply, calmly, how it is, and they're screaming at you at the top of your lungs. Are they really right in that situation? Of course not. But it's what the business puts forth. It's this idea that they try to continue because the last thing they want to do is lose that customer. And furthermore, they're afraid of even worse things. They're afraid of being sued or misrepresented or all the bad things in their mind that could happen from a business point of view. But we know this idea that the customer is always right. It's not true in that sense. It's not true when it comes to business. It's not true in the secular world, and it's especially not true spiritually. As we're applying this idea that we are the customers, and that what God is offering us, that this is the sales pitch, if you will, of what we need. We need the relationship with Him. We need the forgiveness that only He can offer, then we know we're not right. Even though we are created in God's image, and we can go back to Genesis chapter 1, and we can see that when God created everything, He said, behold, it was very good. We are not always right just because of that. We see this stated once back in the book of Judges chapter 17. There in verse 6, it simply states, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And, of course, we don't have to go into much depth or much detail to illustrate why that wasn't right, why that didn't work out. If everyone does what's right in their own eyes, it might seem right to them, but it's certainly not going to be right with everyone else. And it's definitely not going to be right when it comes to God. We all have different ideas and different opinions. 
And while everyone is entitled to their opinion, we have to understand that's all it is at the end of the day. It's just an idea. It's just an opinion. That doesn't make it so. And this is where so many people would try to argue against absolute truth and say that everything is relative or it's just a matter of perspective. Well, not from what we read there. And certainly not from what we read in the rest of God's Word. Let's take a moment and read Proverbs chapter 14. In Proverbs chapter 14, it says there starting with verse 9, Fools mock at the guilt offering, but the upright enjoy acceptance. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. You notice in the verses directly preceding that one, verse 12, that it shows a contrast there between the wise and the foolish and the wicked and the upright. So again, this idea that everything is just relative and it might be good, it might be right from a certain point of view, that doesn't hold up. There is one who is wicked, there is one who is doing something that is wrong, that is clearly against God, and there is one who is righteous one who is upright, one who is just. There is a clearly established precedent of right and wrong, and we can know which side of that we are on. But it's not based on ourselves. Because it says there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. So while we know that there is clearly a right and wrong, God gave us a conscience for a reason. We can understand that. It's not up to us to determine what is right or wrong. If we just stop the lesson right here, if this was the only thing that we read from this point on, it's just this passage, we can understand that. It's a basic principle of life. And we understand it in so many other things. This is the way it is. It's not up to us to determine it. So yeah, there are things that are going to seem right to us. A lot of people think they have a good grip on life, not just in the physical sense that they have a good job and a family and all that, but they think they know what they need to know, spiritually speaking. They've they've read enough philosophy books. They know things about how they're to treat other people and to find uh, inner peace and all of that, and they think they're okay. And it might seem right to them, but we can become convinced of an awful lot of things. A lot of things seem right to us. You know, so many times we we bring up the fact that at one time people knew, they just knew, that the earth was flat. It was accepted. It seemed to make sense. That was the logical point of view that was put forth at the time. It seemed right. But now we look back and we say, how absurd and how ridiculous. How could anyone ever think that? There are things that seem good an awful lot of the time, but it doesn't make it so. And so what we really look at when people would say, well, the customer is is always right. Not only is this just a a ploy to try to gain new customers, try to keep the ones that you have, just try try to keep them happy. It's done out of desperation because they don't want to lose those customers. Because in that business sense, to them, that's the worst thing in the world is to lose someone. And spiritually, we can see where they're coming from. If we understand that we, the human beings, are the customers, and this is what God is offering, for Him to lose a customer, for someone to walk away from God, to go their life never knowing Him, never having their sins forgiven through the blood of Christ, it's an awful thing. It's a terrible thing. It grieves God. But one thing we understand very clearly from Scriptures is that as much as it grieves Him, He will allow it to happen because He gives us free will. He allows us to choose. And just because we have that choice, just because we make certain decisions that go go against Him, He is not going to change to try to accommodate that. God does not compromise. And neither should we when it comes to this. Again, in the business world, we see this. The customer is always right. When someone is making a fuss, making a scene, and they have probably no no leg to stand on. 
They don't have a case. They are clearly in the wrong, but the business will do whatever they can. They will take care of their bill. They'll give them something free in the future, something to appease them, to make them happy so they don't cause any more problems there, so they can keep future business. They're desperate, and so they compromise. Even though this person hasn't done anything to deserve this preferential treatment, even though they're clearly in the wrong, they won't admit it because they're afraid. And what we're really driving at with the lesson for this morning is do we sometimes do the same thing? Are we guilty of compromising the message of the gospel because we're afraid? Afraid of hurting someone's feelings, afraid of them never speaking to us again, whatever it might be. Do we try to bend it, try to twist it around to say, well, no, you're right. Even though we can go to book, chapter, and verse to, set, to show, well, no, God says this isn't something we should be doing. God says this is what we need to be doing. God says this is the worship that he accepts, and that's clearly not what's going on. So again, is this something that we are guilty of? Is this an approach that we take sometimes in our teaching? That when we're talking to someone and they say, well, I think this is how it is, that we agree with them even though we know the scriptures do not. We need to be careful. And of course, when we look at this, like we've said, businesses do this to try to appease people, try to make them happy, and there is an immediate result to it. Business puts out the sign and says the customer is always right. They're going to gain new customers. It's going to do exactly what they want it to do in, in the short term. They do this to try to make people happy, that we're going to do everything we can to accommodate you, to make you feel good, and it doesn't matter. If people hear what they want to hear, then of course they're going to draw closer to that person. Of course they're going to want to hear more. We're just hardwired like that. We as human beings, like we said, we resist change. And even though we know on an innate level that none of us are perfect and no one could ever be right all the time, we always like to hear that we're right. No one likes to be told that they're wrong. You go back to Jeremiah chapter 23. In the Old Testament book of Jeremiah chapter 23 and they are starting with verse 16. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, It shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, No disaster will come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? Behold, the storm of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. When you look back and think back to Jeremiah and the time of, of his life and his prophesying, it was one of the saddest times for the nation of Israel of just how far they had fallen from the glory days of David and Solomon and the United Kingdom. And now, not only had the kingdom been divided so long ago, but more than half of them have already been taken into captivity. The northern kingdom of Israel is already gone. And now it's just the southern kingdom of Judah, just the, those two, three tribes left. And now they are about to go into captivity. And Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because he was there to see it. And even though he told them time and time again what they needed to do to repent, to turn back to God, to go to him for help, not to Egypt, not to any of the other kings, not to make any kind of alliances, but they were to trust in God. They were to be obedient to him. And they just wouldn't listen. And what we see here is at that same time there were a lot of other people going around and speaking prophecies, but they weren't from God. Why they did it? 
I don't know. Why they thought this would be a good idea to go around telling everybody that it's going to be okay. No calamity is going to befall you. You're not going to be taken into captivity to lull them into that false sense of security. But it's what people wanted to hear. And it's why God is telling them here, don't listen. It's a popular message. It's something you want to hear, but don't believe it. Because they haven't gotten this from God. It's not from Him. It's not what you need to hear. And again, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Sometimes what we want to hear and what we need to hear are two very different things. And while we might not always be in a situation like this, we might not always be directly the guilty party the way the kingdom of Judah was, where they were in a position where they were guilty of idolatry and they needed to repent, they needed to turn back to God. Maybe that's not all that relevant to us. But this principle still holds. When you tell people what they want to hear, regardless of any truth behind it, they're, wanting, they're going to want to keep hearing. It's going to be a popular message. And so those are the ones that are going to gain the support. They're going to gain in the business sense, the customers. Those are the religions, the world, that are going to be growing and have the, the more vocal support. Whereas those who would teach the gospel message in its truth, in its entirety, not trying to shift it, change it, to accommodate people, to make them happy, the ones who are actually speaking the truth, the whole truth, what happens is in the short term they're viewed as closed-minded. That they are, they are intolerant. That they need to just get with the time. That's the immediate result. That's the short-term result of what happens when people say, no, you're, you're right. We need to do this. You're right. You can still live like that. You can have these things in your life and still be a Christian and still be pleasing to God. Have that relationship with Him. That might be the immediate result. But as we're going to see in just a moment, the long term is ever so slightly different. And the Apostle Paul, of course, talks about this in the New Testament in 2 Timothy chapter 4. In 2 Timothy 4, starting with verse 2, he says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebu rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own lusts and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. So he tells Timothy, this is how it's going to be. The time is coming where people aren't going to want to hear this. But he ends it there in verse 5. He ends that paragraph by saying, as for you, you just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. It doesn't matter what they want to hear. It doesn't matter how much they would change, or how much they might want you to change. Don't change the message. Preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season. And he says there, they will not endure sound teaching. The word sound, we've talked about this before, it means stable. A structure is sound if you can build upon it, if people can be in that, that building or that house without the fear of it collapsing in on them. Our teaching is sound when it holds up. But the sad thing is, what Paul is describing here, these people with itching ears who just want to hear what they want to hear, when it's a pleasing message to them, when it's a message that everything's fine and you don't have to change and it's going to be good from here on out, a lot of times they don't take the time to check to see if that holds up or if it makes any sense. They like what they're hearing and so they just run with it without any examination as to whether or not the teaching is sound. They're not like the Bereans we talked about on Wednesday night. They don't search the Scriptures. They don't examine these things. They just like what they're hearing. They want it to stay that way. But as we said, that's the immediate result. As time goes on, we see things start to change a little bit. 
And how much time this takes, I can't really say. I can't really tell you. It's different for every person. It's different for, for each congregation. But always, it is the same that one compromise leads to another, and another, and another. Individuals who are willing to bend the truth on one thing, what's to stop them from bending it on something else? It's what we call a slippery slope. In the business world, people who would kowtow to their customers, no matter how ridiculous the demand is, will eventually start giving in to something else, and something else, and something else, and eventually you start to wonder why even have company policies if there's always going to be someone who is exempt from it or someone who manages to find a way around it because they see it as, as not fair. And it's the same way as we know in the religious world. When we look at God's Word, when we see the plain teaching of the Bible and what it's telling us, but then people decide, well, I know that it says that they observe the, the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, but it would be more convenient if we would just suit people's schedules and we would offer it on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. You know, whenever, whenever they come in, they can do this. Even though we don't have a commandment to do that, even though we see no example for it, we have no authority to do such a thing, they bend it on that one. Now in every other aspect, they're still worshiping God exactly the way they're supposed to. They're singing to Him. They're praising Him. They're teaching His Word. They're not, they're not leaving anything out. They simply changed the day a little bit. But if you can change that again, the question is, why not change something else? If you're willing to bend a little bit, why not a little bit more? And a little bit more. Because it's easier that way. Because it avoids confrontation. It avoids a fight. You know, that's what we see over in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, it says there, starting with verse 13, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. It says the easy way, the wide way, leads to destruction. And there are a lot of people on it. And we know why. Because it's easy. Because it's wide. So yeah, the majority of people will just go along with whatever. As long as it sounds good. As long as it's making people happy, then that's what we're going to do. And so you see... Religions. You see organizations who every few years will get together and try to come up with a new definition of what sin is. As if that could ever change or would ever change. Or that it would ever be up to us to decide that. And you see people who, even though they resist change as we all do, they say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. And... Just decide to not fight, to avoid confrontation, and just go along with it. To compromise again and again. Eventually, it doesn't even look like what it used to. You see something that would call itself a church, but you look in the New Testament, you look in the book of Acts, you see what those disciples were doing, and then you see churches today, and... It's hard to see a resemblance. It might call itself the same thing. It might have a few similarities on the surface, but it's not. In the business world, people offer a product, they offer a service, and it might start out one way, but if they change because their customers want something else, eventually they change so much that they're not even doing what they used to at the beginning. The product has completely changed. And while that might be fine in the business world, you do what you need to do to stay in business, to keep food on the table. Spiritually speaking, that's not an option for us. Because the product hasn't changed. God, His Word, 
a relationship with Him, forgiveness of sins. It's not something we can go somewhere else and get. God is the only one who offers this. He's the only one who can. And He is the one who sets the terms. It has to be through Christ, through His blood. As Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. So many people want to have a relationship with God and want to be spiritual, but they don't like the confines of organized religion and they don't like the, the Bible. They have issues with trust and they, they think that it's been corrupted or contaminated by man throughout the years, whatever reason someone might give. But it's not what God is offering. We need to be careful in our lives. And we might think, well, this is something that other people are doing. This is something that we see in, in denominations and, and other religions that this is what they're doing, that they compromise the truth. But we need to be careful that we don't get into that mindset. Don't pretend like it could never happen with us or with someone that we know. If we compromise the truth, if when someone tells us something that we know goes against the Bible, do we just nod our head and say, okay? Do we tell them that it's right when we know that it's not? If we know that the customer is not always right clearly, then how can we go on pretending as if they are? Now clearly there's a way in which we need to approach people. As Paul spoke to Timothy, he told them to reprove, to rebuke, and exhort with all authority. There's a way to rebuke that is helpful. There's a way to rebuke that is not. And there's a way we can speak the truth in love as we should. And there's a way we can speak the truth that is hurtful. That is going to tear down. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to make sure that in everything we do, that we're doing it in a way that is helping others in a way that is loving them, as we present the gospel, as we make our sales pitch, as it were, we're doing this because we love them, because we don't want to see them be lost. But at the same time, when someone presents something that we know goes against the scriptures, that we know clearly is not right, we are not doing them any favors to make them think that they're right, to keep up that charade, to say, yes, that's, that's right, if it's not right, if we know book, chapter, and verse to show them that it's not approved of by God, that we have no authority for it, we need to let them know that, even if it's not what they want to hear. And they might get upset by that. They might blame us, as it were, and shoot the messenger. But at the end of the day, we need to preach the gospel. We need to uphold this because it's not about us. And it's not about them, the customers, the people we talk to about the gospel. It's about God. They are not always right, and we are not always right. That's another pitfall we need to avoid in thinking that we must be right because we have the Bible. The Bible is right. We can still make mistakes. We do. But as long as we are following this, then we can know where we need to make correction in our lives. We, we know where we need to do better, need to grow. And as long as we know this, then we know what God wants us to do. We can see the message. We can see the pattern and know not to deviate from it, not to compromise, no matter what's popular. No matter what it is that people want to hear, or how much they would say that it's outdated, or we need to get with the times, none of that has any bearing on what is really Sam, on what is really the truth. And when you really stop and think about it, this idea of compromise, begetting compromise, that it goes from bad to worse, and you're straying further and further away from where you were supposed to be to begin with, harkens back to something Jesus said back in Matthew chapter 23. He says here, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. 
for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, oh, excuse me. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you will receive the greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Jesus had quite an, an awful lot to say about the scribes and the Pharisees of his day, and none of it was, was particularly good. They were so focused on appearances, they were so focused on being legalistic about the law and checking things off a list, they had gotten away from the spirit of the law, from the principle of why they did those things. And while they were very careful to tithe all the right herbs, while they were very studious in their lives, and very active, as he says, to go out and make proselytes of people the way they were teaching them because it lacked any substance. It wasn't helping them at all. So while they might have appeared to be religious, and they certainly had that reputation among Israel that they were the ones who knew the law, who kept the law, they were the strictest sect. The final product didn't even resemble what it was, what it was supposed to be. God's people following His law, they didn't have it. They might have had the appearance of it, but the reality was, was far different. And again, it's no different for us today. So many people have made so many changes through the years to try to make people happy, to avoid any kind of confrontation, to try to get more people in the doors, try to fill the pews, fill the seats, that what it is now doesn't even come close to what the first century church was. And the message that they're presenting and calling the gospel, it's not the message that we see from Christ. It's not what was preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost. It's not what Paul preached when he went on his missionary journeys. The message has changed. And while people may think that, well, it's just a, a little bit different. The main thought behind it is the same. With the message changed as much as it has, people are not receiving what they think they are. People all over the world are being told that because they've prayed a certain prayer, because they've made a, a statement of faith that they're saved and everything's good when they don't know God's Word. They don't know the real gospel message. It's a sad, sad state of affairs. But as I said, we ought not to get caught up in that idea that it's something that happens to, to other people. Or that this is something that, that might happen somewhere else but couldn't happen here. We need to be careful. We have the Great Commission. We have so many passages telling us that we're to go out into the world to talk to people and why we're to do so. But we need to be aware and we need to be cautious that we're not so wrapped up in the, the sales pitch of trying to talk to someone, trying to invite them to serve, trying to get them to talk about the Bible, that it gets in the way of the message. At the end of the day, we're not important. And not to be mean, but they are not important. The message is what matters. Paul said he's not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God to salvation. That's the power that it has. That is the good news. We need to present it in its entirety. We need to present it in love. People will choose to listen or not listen. We might make some people angry. We try to avoid that as best we can, but sometimes we have no control over that. And while people are always going to be looking for what they want to hear, people are always going to be looking for a message that is convenient for them, God's Word stays the same. And it's the Word that we have to teach. And while it might be discouraging for us sometimes to hear so many no's, 
They know they don't want to come and worship. No, they don't want to come to Bible study. They're not interested in talking about the Bible. They're looking for something different. We need to continue on. As Paul told Timothy, preach the Word. No matter what they do, don't let it change the message. You keep on teaching. Endure that suffering. Teach sound doctrine. Because that's what we need. It's what we all need. God loves us so much that He sent His Son to die. Christ loved us enough to come, to go through all of that agony so that we could have the hope of heaven. And He offers it to us freely. As He said, He's offering rest, eternal rest. But it does require that we take His yoke. It requires that we learn from Him. He has done His part. Now He asks us to do ours. To believe in that. Believe in Him. That we repent of our sins. That requires admitting that we're wrong. That we turn away from that. That we turn to Him. That we confess that He is the Son of God. And then that we be immersed in water. Buried in baptism. So we can have those sins washed away. And rise to walk in newness of life. If someone this morning has not done that, is not a child of God, if you are outside of Christ, there's time and opportunity right now for you to become a Christian, for you to start your life over with a clean slate right before God. There's every reason to be in Christ. And there's no reason to remain lost in sin, separated from God. Because we know one stays in that condition. If they were to die, or Christ is, come, is to come back, whatever would happen first, then they would remain separated, lost for eternity. We don't want that for you. God does not want that for you. But if this morning you have done so, you are living as a Christian, but yet in your life you have made mistakes and you have fallen short. God knows that we are not perfect and He continues to offer forgiveness. It is there, readily available for you, for all of us. If, you're, if you have sin, repent of that sin. Go to God in prayer. Ask Him to forgive you. And the members here will pray with you, will pray for you, whatever you might need. Let us know and we can help you as best we can. If you have spiritual needs this morning, would you come have a seat on the front while we stand, while we sing.